All right, so uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, last year, I, I was sort of, as you heard, a last-minute addition. I did this uh, slideshow last year for, for an event called PodCamp. I uh, know one, one of you saw it, but uh, here, who was here? Uh, this is sort of a, a really uh, high-level uh, sort of uh, for, for beginners, but I'll just sort of blow. The plan is to blow through this in about 10 minutes, and then I'll show you some uh, actual code running on an Android uh, emulator, just walk you through some of the, just sort of give you sort of a high level, quick introduction to uh, Android uh, development. So, uh, just a little bit about me. I have a bit.ly link if you really want to see this, but yeah, I, I have a degree. I, I, I did, I've been to Silicon Valley. I've been doing Android since two years. I've actually been doing it for three years. And anybody who knows me know I like to cook and I've been volunteering with Toronto Cut Rescue. Um, Kenny and Spencer, those are my cats. Occasionally, I've decorated the odd cake before. Um, introducing Android. Oh, just gotta blow through this. Yeah, Android happened a long time ago at Cal Virgin One. Uh, Android 2017, actually, it's we're up to Android, what is it, 8 Oreo now. Uh, there's over a billion devices in the world running Android. It runs on phones, tablets, watches, whatever. We're just gonna go through. Android NuGet API. Actually, we're up to about 27 now, I believe, is the, the number. It runs on tablets, surprise. It runs on Wear, which are kind of the, uh, the watches or whatever. So which basically all the watches really do is just mean when you get notifications on your phone, hops on your watch kind of deal. And uh, there's Android Auto, which basically with Android Audio, it just means you can do audio and you can uh, do, uh, do text things. Android TV, should you want to watch TV? And uh, there's Android of Things. If you want to do Raspberry Pi, you can sort of do Android-based things. On the Raspberry Pi, um, Android market share. I'm not going to tell anybody here that as far as the numbers go, that uh, Android is uh, the large platform by far. Uh, Android versions. You can just go through. Well, a Android version breakdown. The big thing to take away from this is generally as a rule is uh, if you look at... Uh, iOS devices, their latest version usually represents about 78% of all the installed devices, whereas uh, Android 8.01, which my Pixel 2 is actually running, probably only about 4%, if we're lucky, about 4% of the, the actual Android devices out there are running the current version of, uh, of Android. Basically, the big thing, the big reason why uh, that is, is Android's popular in the emerging markets. The vast majority of Android devices are in um, Places like South America, Southeast Asia, Africa. The reason why this is important is because in, if you watch a lot of the uh, Google Talks, uh, they'll tell you a lot to consider. Uh, like what they'll tell you is, are the phones that we have now in this room, uh, we're at best maybe 5% of what the mobile market is. The vast majority of users don't have um, devices like this with fast CPUs, with reliable data connections, with... with um, with, with the reliable internet. Like most people in the world, if they don't have Wi-Fi, they don't have any form of access to their devices. For the vast majority of the world, uh, the first computer they've owned is actually their, uh, their phone. Also too, the Android uh, upgrade process can be a little complicated uh, if you're getting into phones because of the process it has to go through. I just put complicated process in brackets. You know, sometimes too, maybe uh, the, uh, well, there's a lot of emphasis on iOS, where and typically people seem to do Android after the fact. But here was one that happened last year where Snapchat said, oh, we're not growing. It's because we don't have a very good Android platform. Um, Android apps. Well, skip. Um, I don't think we need to know. I think we all can sort of agree what's good about apps. The big thing here, just sort of uh, the introduction to the Android operating system. Android is actually a derivative of the Linux kernel. So as you can see here at the bottom, uh, there's a Linux kernel. On top of that, we have the, uh, the libraries. All Android devices come with uh, SQLite. So if you're looking for apps, you're going, what database do I have? You already have SQLite. There's OpenGL. There's SSL. Uh, the important thing here is the, uh, the runtime. There's uh, the operating itself system itself. Comes with the Dalvik uh, virtual machine and a bunch of core libraries. 
Uh, there's the application framework. This is how do we manage the activities, the services, uh, getting the Wi-Fi status, knowing what the network is. And then on top of that, we have the applications. Most of what uh, you do is, you know, if you're, if you're going to take this on, you'll be working at the uh, application layer. What actually happens, you know, if you decide uh, that you want to do your own uh, Android operating system because you can download the source and do your modifications. Uh, for instance, people like Samsung, LTE, uh, whatever. What ends up happening is, is they get their, uh, they, will, they will download, like Google will release what's called a reference operating system. But for things like camera, for instance, one of the things you'll notice is that very few uh, applications, uh, you know, outside of maybe Facebook or whatever, large things, most Android applications don't do their own camera. If you want to take a picture, you'll probably default to your, your operating system's uh, camera application because the reality is, is that most that no two um, Android phones have the same camera. So the, the operating system itself will sort of specify what the uh, camera should look like and then they're responsible for the implementation. But if you want to uh, make it your own camera application, like for instance, Facebook, uh, the Messenger, you can do your own um, photos or Instagram or Snapchat, one of those. They literally have about through like 400 devices and they're responsible. If you want to make it, uh, if you want to do your own camera app, you have to support like 300 devices. So you'll find that for the most part, that on that scale, you have to be a large company with the resources to make it happen. But sort of, you know, to advance the thing here, as far as from the application's point of view, assuming you don't want to do systems programming or modify your own uh, Linux, your own Android thing. Uh, basically, we don't worry about this stuff. All the stuff is abstracted, like how does the camera work? We don't really need to know as application developers. Then uh, to take it one step further. So how does the actual Wi-Fi and other stuff, does it, you know, that's where the Android SDK comes in. So basically what we have is we just have our applications and the Android SDK is responsible for making uh, everything that we need to happen as far as the uh, Android uh, plumbing goes. And then basically your app, there we go. Um, the Android application development options, native applications are done in the uh, Java programming language. Uh, you do have the ability for things like C, C++, uh, which is called the native uh, development kit. Uh, there's also Kotlin, which when I did this was kind of a night was, was kind of an optional language, but is now considered a, uh, a first class language. Android Studio fully supports Kotlin and Java. And you notice now a lot of Android tutorials actually do their code uh, in Kotlin as opposed to Java. Um, apps written in Java are referred to as uh, native apps. Uh, there's other forms out there, things like React Native, Ionic, uh, Zamarian, there's Unity if you want to do game development, there's progressive web apps and uh, mobile websites. The advantages of native app development, basically you do reduce memory, you take advantage of speed, uh, users appreciate native experiences, can function offline, greater control of the user experience. For instance, React Native, where one of the issues where it really has been falling down is, um, is in the frame rate because, because of how fr uh, React Native is structured, it basically introduces an, an increasing an extra CPU load, which means the CPU has to do more, which means you can't render the screen as quickly, which means you put a lot of job, dropped frames and ends up what they call a janky app. Um, basically putting the app together, uh, Android Studio, although uh, if you want to get a, a IntelliJ, it supports a Android development out of the box, Java programming language, the user experience, the material design, uh, the testing environment, you can do virtual Android virtual devices, in real devices, deployment, you have Google Play, and there's also, you can do custom applications. Quick word on material design. Basically, material design is the uh, best practices uh, of how you should design an application. Material design is kind of a talk unto itself. It specifies things like where the buttons go, what the text looks like, what colors it should be, the, the experience. Um, if you look at the Google uh, website, everything up and down, uh, they adhere to material design, everything from your, uh, everything from your uh, Google Cloud services and mid council to your Gmail are all adhering to material design. One of the interesting things about, uh, about Google applications is they actually bring the material design uh, specification to their other iOS apps. So if you have a uh, iOS uh, 
application from Google. It'll actually adhere to the material design. Uh, basically, this sort of, it gets into a whole bunch of stuff. We're Java, not UX people here. Uh, oh, Duke, yay. Uh, does anybody here need an introduction to Java? I assume we're kind of, you know, past that. I have Hello World. Anybody <laughs> want to walk through? Do you need a walk through on Hello World? You know? <laughs> um, yeah. So here's the big difference between Java and Java on Android is basically in Java, they basically have the Java bytecode that runs on top of the Java uh, VM. Uh, on the left here, on the right, they introduce another step and they basically take the class file and compile it to uh, Dalvik bytecode and then run it on top of the, uh, the Dalvik VM on Android. Uh, the whole lawsuit that involved Oracle versus uh, Google was the whole thing. Google claims that Java's always said uh, run anywhere. The problem is, is that when you introduce the Dalvik, uh, the whole DEX files, which is a Dalvik bytecode, your, uh, your DEX code can only run on Android devices. It can't run anywhere else. And Google and Oracle's assertion was uh, it violates the um, spirit of Java and has damaged them to the tune of, I think, about, what, $9 billion or something like that. So that's sort of where, that, that was sort of right there. This little thing demonstrates the big hang up with uh, Oracle versus Google. Writing Android code, I'll just show you. We get into Android Studio. Blah, blah, blah. This is the big thing, just sort of the, the sort of the four pieces of a uh, Android application at the bottom. This is what you're mostly familiar with, or what we call the activities. The activities, for the most part, represent the screens of the, uh, of the application. This represents the UI and all the logic that uh, makes the UI function. Sort of not function here, not sort of what, what users don't see, but it's also there. You see pieces of, there's something called broadcast receivers. You can uh, generate events, your application. Other apps can generate events. You can also listen for uh, system events. For instance, you can, uh, you can create a broadcast receiver that will um, listen for um, if there's a low power. Because when your system hit, when Android hits about 15%, it's going to generate a, uh, a low power event. And it will listen if there's any broadcast receivers that, are, um, that have asked for permission, that, have, that are listening for that event. It will let them know, okay, this event has run. Um, do with it uh, uh, as you will. Uh, there's um, services, which are essentially um, pieces of code that um, run in the background. They run independent of your uh, activity uh, and content providers is basically just a way, because normally what happens is all the, uh, your applications are sandboxed. So if you want to save your data to a, uh, to say a SQLite database, uh, you can, but nobody else can access it. Um, if you want other applications to be able to access your data, you can create what's called the content provider. It's basically a whole bunch of boilerplate code that allows other applications to get access uh, to your data. Um, the four pieces of the Android app, as I said, the activity, this is the user facing part of the app. This is what most people think of when they, th they think of the, uh, the, the uh, screens. The broadcast receiver is basically there to handle events. You can have handle uh, app generated events or system events. Uh, services run in the background. Uh, they can perform tasks outside of the uh, application. It used to be services, or how uh, you could um, you could you could um, listen for event. You could basically run in the background, and you could pull and listen for other events. But what happens is that now with Android, because they keep changing, because the big thing with the new versions is they change how background every pretty much every iteration of um, Android will change how background tasks operate. For instance, now most services that are just listening. To uh, do uh, to do pull events in the background will usually be killed because they only give them so much time. They've been replaced with something called the job scheduler. For instance, it used to be that um, services and other events could run in the background and could query the GPS all the time. With the latest iteration of Android 8, uh, background uh, services and can only query GPS uh, three times an hour. The rationale being the more the more we the more we use the radio, the more we drain the battery. So by limiting background tasks to uh, three times an hour, you're actually helping to save on battery. And uh, the services and basically content 
providers, exposes app data to applications. If you do a job interview for uh, an Android app for Android developer, these are the four things I'll ask you. What are the four pieces of an Android uh, application? Content providers, for the most part, aren't, aren't used uh, these days, but they're still part. Um, sort of, I did a one, I'll, I'll show you this. It was called the Podcast Android app. Put up later, basically the main activity. Main activities come with two pieces, I'll explain later. The activity and the uh, XML layout. And uh, well, we'll just, that you, can, you can edit your XML in the layout file or you can do main activity. Basically, we have our name. The big thing with the app compat activity is uh, Android has something called, uh, what they call app compat, you know, application compatibility. Normally we just say activity, but the problem is because there's so, there's such a wide range of uh, activity uh, of Android out there that it needs to be backwards compatible. There are uh, capability, like there are capabilities that previous versions of Android don't support that the newer ones do. They actually have an entire app compat team and what they'll do is when they um, introduce um, new features to newer versions of Android, they will actually implement those features in, back, in um, older versions of Android. So that's, the, that's, to make the, that's to make it compatible, sort of give you a wider range available to the ecosystem. And by using app compat, you're not sitting there because the other option in Android is you can start asking what version of SDK are we running? And if we're running like version 22, then execute this block of code. Otherwise, if we're version 24, do this block of code, blah, blah, blah. You can sort of cut a lot of stuff out and just use app compat. And the other thing about using the app location compatibility uh, classes as as you move forward your app unless you do unless you update it for um, newer versions of Android itself will be using older Android features and that will make your app assuming you don't update it still able to run a newer versions of uh, Android uh, one of the um, the first method uh, when a uh, when an, when an activity started it was called the on create uh, method which is basically one of the uh, the life cycle methods of a uh, of an activity, it's the first method that get ca gets called when the app is first initialized, and uh, we tell it what layout file to render. And this is just something for doing the uh, greeting. Uh, the Android manifest I'll show later is basically the the, the first file that sort of describes uh, what um, to the operate to the operating system to Android. Uh, what are the pieces of the Android application? Yeah, learning more about Android. There's a few little things here. There's there's some podcasts fragmented. Uh, Android developers backstage. They basically talk to a lot of. It's a Google podcast where they basically talk to the uh, Google people responsible for making uh, Android happen. Uh, Udacity. They have free courses you can go to if you really want to learn. Castro.io does has short tutorials and uh, words of wisdom. Here's the big thing. I got a. I always like to warn you about when you're looking at uh, when you decide you want to you get it you want to uh, look up how to do something in Android you always have to pay very special attention to the date it was written because everything's written because everything in Android changes from year to year because that's they do all the new Android releases every year to year you may find an answer that worked three years ago and the moment you say oh, I'm gonna cut and paste my answer enough of Stack Overflow suddenly you're getting all these deprecation warnings so, or this isn't how it's done. So pay attention to when you're looking at uh, Android tutorials, because if you've seen an Android tutorial that was written five years ago, there's a good chance a lot of what's in it by today's standard isn't relevant anymore. So when you're doing Google searches for at least involving Android, always pay very special attention to the date it was uh, written on Google. And uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, basically Android, there's more meetups or whatever. Um, thanks for listening. I just had to get this cat in there, but anyways, so uh, we'll, uh, so basically just uh, sort of do a, uh, so basically what we have here is, ju is just your basic sort of hello world um, application. Um, this one here, we actually, um, here we'll just sort of, we basically set the text uh, programmatically. There's also a couple ways to do it, uh, sort, sort of step, to do it statically. Um, 
it's IntelliJ, and I'm sure most people are probably using either IntelliJ or Eclipse. It's basically just another Java IDE. Um, Google's basically taken in, uh, IntelliJ and just optimized it all for, uh, for for Google. So they have all the uh, they have all the profiling tools for doing your your Android applications. They have all your uh, you know your build tools. They have it's, everything's here. Uh, project. Uh, the big thing we have we have uh, we'll start with. Uh, The Android uh, manifest. So we'll just so, so basically, here it's, it's like uh, everything's XML. Generally, uh, one of the some of the the uh, criticisms some people mention about uh, Android is there's two ways. You, you spend a lot of time either you're thinking in Java or Kotlin, or you're thinking in XML. This is sort of one application. This is when you um, give give your uh, this is the um, this file specifies everything to the operating system, what it needs to know. They have uh, they have uh, they have a link here to the icon, uh, a link to the uh, you know the label. The label is actually when you look at it on your uh, Android phone. This is what 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 text is going to be displayed. Um, they have right to left. They have a theme. Basically, this 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 can be anything. The main activity, the the action here. Main and launcher. This basically says uh, when the uh, app first loads. Uh, this is the this is the first application that's going to be loaded. Uh, and here I have just sort of for an example here I created a uh, a broadcast receiver. Basically, this broadcast receiver says uh, if there's a, a power connected a system event, it will uh, execute. So, I mean, they have. Uh, Next sort of the uh, thing here is the, now you might, now how, how do we run this? Well, if you, if you don't have an Android device or maybe your Android device isn't one of the latest ones, uh, they do have what they call the, uh, the Android virtual devices. This is, uh, I mean this Pixel 2, all phones you can put in what's called developer options, which if you plug gives you the ability to uh, run all your code. Uh, on the uh, phones, the phones out of the box come uh, designed not to run untrusted apps. Developer options basically says um, run this app anyways. Um, but let's say you want to do, so now here we have the, uh, the Android device manager. So create virtual device. Uh, do you want to create a TV? You can create a watch, you can create a phone, you can create a tablet. Uh, they have uh, they have a whole bunch of different devices already specified. You have your you can do screens, all sorts of uh, other setups or whatever, and you can use these. They run on your computer. The one criticism is about these devices, I will say, is they run um, they they are slow. I mean, because they're they're full functioned emulators. That's the big difference between iOS and Android. Is iOS uses simulators. iOS actually, Android actually runs full functioned. Uh, emulators on their devices. I had this one issue with a new Android developer. He was trying to do Android development on a 10-year-old uh, MacBook. I'm like, it's not going to work. You got to get a new, uh, you know, because it wouldn't even load for him to try to, to run the, uh, the virtual device. It wouldn't load. There's also another one called Jenny Motion, which is a replacement virtual device. So what does it look like? Well, here we go. This is actually the Pixel 2. So this is basically my phone here running on my computer. Um, you can do, they have a few cute little functionalities here, like if we want to uh, rotate the devi device. You can rotate the device. There's a, uh, yeah, you, screen you can do yeah, capture if you want to uh, work on, uh, but yeah, you can, you, you can do things like, um, you can do, if you want to test, uh, we can do, we can do crappy signals. We can do good signals. If you want to kill your battery or whatever, there's a whole bunch of stuff. If you feel, uh, if you want to uh, send yourself a, a text message, you can. You can make the phone ring. But basically, you have the whole ability to take control of, of, the, of the virtual device and sort of make it uh, anywhere that you like. So we can send ourselves a few text messages because maybe you're lonely. Look, we got a text message. If you want to reply to yourself, 
you can because you know there's no shame and you know and being, being alone and you know whatever you know it's like oh you know why doesn't anybody call me well you can call yourself on a vir on a virtual device Um, but, but well, basically, this is just uh, this is. I mean, I'll get into the testing where you can do things like the espresso, whatever the J unit. But this is basically this is just for this is basically just a sort of to give you uh, the function the functionality to, to make the device. But you do have the ability, for instance, things like uh, Robo Electric, whatever. If you want to, because you can something like Robo Electric is a testing framework I'm getting ahead that basically eliminates the need for a phone for a virtual device. And it will actually all run it in software, so you could run your whole, uh, so you could do, so you could basically run all your tests on a, uh, on, on on a simulated device. What if, just sorry, just to interrupt you really too much. Yeah, don't this, worry. Like full, like, uh, it's fully emulated here. And I'm just wondering about like Sauce Labs and those things. Do like, are they actually fully emulated? Like, I, I, I don't have a lot of experience with it. I'll be honest. Okay, yeah, yeah. or any of these like other like uh, Renta, Android, Android. Well, for instance, like, yeah, like some some of them. I mean, for instance, they do. Um, like for instance, Robo Electric, which doesn't even run at all. Like if you don't actually see visually, um, basically do what's called shadow. So they basically take all the activities and the other stuff and mimic the functionality without actually implementing the functionality. So your software, if it uh, if it wants to um, open a window can, or say a dialog box, open a dialog box, it'll call everything, but it won't actually happen, like on a device. So um, this, for instance, so if we want to take our uh, so anyway, so this is basic. So this is um, ideally, depending what it is. I mean, em emulators are great, but for instance, if you if you have an app that does GPS, it doesn't work very well. So get yourself an actual phone. Uh, you'll find that, for instance, if you get into like a lot of serious development, you'll find a lot of people go and not only do they use their latest phones, but they buy older phones because you should be trying your app not just on uh, the latest one, but on older phones as well. Where, you know, because that's sort of the, um, whereas a lot of iOS people tend to target the latest Android, you got to give a lot of consideration to targeting uh, older devices. Because otherwise, if you're trying to make it your app out there, you're going to significantly limit who will actually use your device. And one of the biggest reasons why applications are abandoned is performance. One of the biggest uh, reasons for, uh, low, um, for, for, for low scores is performance. That's usually what users' biggest criticisms of applications, their performance. So what they call perf matters, you hear Google say. Um, so you have to give a look. So do try to make sure your app works well on lower uh, powered devices. Just to go off on that, uh, WhatsApp. One of the biggest reasons why it's taken over the world is, you know, but most of us haven't heard of it here, is because they target uh, lo low, um, low, cap low, uh, low powered devices. And, they, and it runs very well. So... Where you get where, where so when you go out to places like Africa and South America where they don't have the latest and greatest technology, they need an app that runs fairly that that that, that actually that actually works. So they said so if we go go if we want to run here, we can compile. Um, the other thing, little thing too to mention here while I'm sort of going off is. Um, Android is all done using uh, the Gradle build system. I, mean, I know a lot of people are Maven, but if you do uh, anything in um, Android, you'll be doing Gradle. And they have a lot of Gradle tasks to run. So usually one of the biggest criticisms of when you're doing uh, anything uh, you know, Android related is um, the, build, the build times with Gradle can be uh, incredibly slow. In fact, it's probably one of the slowest parts of the development process is waiting for Gradle to do everything as uh, uh, we're we're doing it here, so you have. Um, that's why. That's why. Ideally, um, if you can, um, you do really want to do Android. Get yourself like an SSD or something like that to speed things up and more memory, uh, the better. So here we've just sort of we just ran our first app here, the little app here, um, sort of uh, just sort of yeah. Yeah, they take it advantage of that. Like, yeah, they do. Yeah, I mean, they do the Gradle daemon or whatever. There are things if you're depending where your where your machine's at, you can get um, you can you can do things to improve the, uh, the heap stack and a whole bunch of other 
uh, configurations. But the reality is with the Gradle on Android, I know from having just upgraded is having a good machine really is probably your, the best thing you can do uh, for your Gradle build times. Uh, this is a sort of a simple uh, sort of, uh, most of the lay all the layouts in Android are uh, in XML files. This one here, just to show you an example, is we have the, um, we have what's called the linear layout, which is very simple. It either lays things out horizontally or uh, vertically. Uh, we have the text view, which is basically just displays text. Um, all, uh, all widgets have a, have a layout width and a layout height. The two options are, are match parents. So basically we want a width on this text view that's as wide as the parent frame, which is the linear layout. And then you have the layout height, which basically wrap content. We only want it as high as it needs to be. We can specify the text size. There's all sorts of other, you know, we can, uh, So we can you can you can, you can specify all, all the stuff too the text alignments the size the gravity um, you can do it all uh, programmatically as well I, we set the text here as well you have the ability too you can actually ignore the XML files and you can build your whole UI programmatically but it gets to be kind of a nightmare um, the other thing too uh, to get here just so we go we go to the res file um, this is our basic layout now one of the things about layouts is uh, we can specify layouts for, we can do layouts for portrait, layout, layouts for, uh, you can say render a layout if it's portrait, render a different layout if it's in landscape. You can specify layouts based on language codes. So you can do a different layout for the Chinese language, a different layout for the French language. Like this can really be um, blown up similarly to for your values. We can create different strings depending upon uh, what language we're using with actually with Android Studio, we can actually um, submit the strings file. They have a language translation service that if you're willing to pay the money, they'll basically go through the, uh, they'll basically go through your, uh, th through your uh, strings notification, through all these strings, you can have them translated so they can come back for uh, different languages, sort of the, uh, so the, the, the amount of customization that's available, internationalization, is all here sort of in the XMLs. We can do the colors. You can get into themes. You can do, um, you can override the Android themes, generate your own themes. Like sort of the sky is the, uh, the limit here as far as um, uh, what you want to do here. Now, we'll just go back here to, now let's say for instance, like debugging the app. Uh, we, we have, uh, we, we do have log cut. For instance, if we specify here, the log cut, we'll just do, oh. so basically there's a whole lot of uh, applications that are currently running on the emulator. And uh, these are all the log cut messages that are being generated. We can see them in real time. If you want to plug your phone in, you'll see all the stuff that's uh, generated. Uh, we have the ability here, so. Yeah, you can use it to create a filter, so, because you don't really need to see, uh, so if we, we run it again. See, so hello world. So it's based, so, so basically, what, so just just much like we used to do system dot out dot print lines in your Java apps to see what was happening, we can do it here. Um, it's sort of a talk unto itself, but IntelliJ has a uh, has a fully featured uh, debugger, so we can do breakpoints and all sorts of other uh, stuff like that if we want to. Uh, So if we want to, so now we'll uh, we'll make a barf. We'll do a null planner exception. 
So if you've ever wondered, if you run Android, when you see uh, that, that kind of error, what, what, what went wrong, you, uh, you the app somewhere generated an L pointer exception. Um, one of the thing, big things about, um, about Kotlin, one of the reasons people love Kotlin is sort of this um, little error message. This little thing I created here is impossible in Kotlin, but because it's, uh, Yeah, but, but generally what would happen is No, but that's sort of, you know, but the, this one Yeah, I mean you can still do null point because because Kotlin runs on top of Android or runs on top of Java So you're still if you have if you're using a lot for instance a Java library, you know can still but but as far as just just your basic things Oh, yeah Yeah. Yeah, but we have. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we have the ability. Oh. See, oh my God! See, so so we can so we can see so we can look at our uh, our stack traces, whatever, to see what went wrong. One of the sort of fast forwarding here. One of the issues uh, when you put your when you put your app out in the wild, you publish it, you don't get access to the stuff. Uh, there's sites. I don't know if you've heard of Crashlytics, um, Firebase, a whole bunch of other solutions. You can actually install them. What they'll do is when it when your code generates exceptions in production you can actually it'll actually log it for you on a server and then you can see what types of uh, what, what type of stuff what your code's actually doing in production when it crashes when it goes wrong and, um, but this will but this is sort of sort of showing you how uh, potentially how if we want we can uh, uh, debug our app what was it the, the whole thing too to get into sort of mentioned here with the uh, with the Android life cycle is um, Just sort of this, run this here again to sort of show something is um, one of the one of the things to consider when you're doing an Android app is you have no control over how it will die. For, like they, they have a for instance, if um, the Android have a series of uh, lifecycle functions on create, uh, on start, on resume, and then you have your app. But let's say for instance, you get a phone call. The user gets a phone call. Uh, the app will get will, uh, they'll call the uh, the uh, on pause, and then let's say they, I don't know, after they're, they're reading, they're, they're on the phone, somebody says, have you seen that email? So they go to speaker, and then they open their Gmail. So now the, so now the, the app's uh, gone to the, uh, on, uh, to, to the, on, uh, the on stop state. And there is potentially an on destroy method, but we never use it because it may never get called. Because ultimately what happens is you always, so don't, so with you, if you have an application, you can't, you have to save your data all the time. You just can't assume at some point I'll save this later. You all, your app has to always give some consideration that it, you have no control over how it will terminate and under what circumstances. Now that said, to give you uh, one uh, example here is if we uh, open the uh, now if we uh, rotate the screen. You'll notice that uh, the help the on create method got called uh, another time. Now what happens is is when one of the the, the things that will bite a lot of people uh, in the butt uh, when they're doing app development is um, screen rotation actually will destroy the activity, and then it will put it up together again. And depending if you're not doing your activity wrong, you can end up with a bunch of um, if if, you, if your uh, references if you're holding on to references where you shouldn't be. You can end up with memory leaks and all sorts of other issues. If you're doing network calls, maybe you want to persist your data, you know, across the application. So if we have, uh, we can override. These are you have a whole bunch of. Uh, so 
So let to give you one, they have uh, So what happens is, is uh, we, we have these bundles, which are basically just uh, key, uh, key stores, key value pairs. And uh, what we can do, for instance, is let's say instead of doing a network call, you can, in, you can, you can implement whatever on save instance on state. We can, so we'll save this. And then what we'll do here is see what happens here with on create is you notice the save instance state here is if we just first create the app, this will be, be null. But assuming we did something like uh, rotate the screen, Say, say. Yeah, I get in the habit. The other thing, too, I'll say that it can bite you. If, you're, if you start doing this in any form of serious capacity, get in a point of using final strings. Otherwise, you'll be screwing. If you don't remember what you use, it kind of screws everything up. But if we want to rerun the app, and then we want to rotate the string. What happened was is uh, so. So what happened in that case is the uh, when the before what happened was is before the um, before it actually destroyed the app the activity it called say on save instant state save the bundle and then passed it into the new activity. So uh, that's what's happened there. So that's how, for instance, if you're doing network calls, uh, you can avoid uh, things getting uh, you know having to hit hit things uh, a second time. Um, the other issue too to um, I'll mention too with uh, with Android is um, it's uh, it's threaded. Basically, everything here that we have uh, runs on what's called the main thread or the UI thread. W one of the limitations of Android that's actually that's actually enforced by the operating system is you can't do a lot on the UI thread. The moment you try to say open a, a, a socket connection on the UI thread, you'll actually throw a, you'll throw an exception. Because uh, the thing, the, the thought process was that if you were doing in the beginning, you could, but then the thought process about five years ago was uh, network activity comes with a latency attached to it, and you can never actually be sure how your network activities are going to perform. Network activities can cause the um, UI to um, to potentially could could hurt the UI performance. So you all, so you have to run your um, you have to do all your network activities off another thread. Um, or there's, a, there's a variety of ways of doing it. The, um, the textbook way of doing it is async tasks. The, the issue with async tasks is async tasks are, um, they involve a lot of boilerplate. Um, it's possible if you don't do it right that you're, if you do a screen rotation and you're running an async task, uh, your, ta your activity can be destroyed but your async task won't. And then it will come back looking for an activity that isn't there. It will also hold on to a lot of memory that isn't there. One of the big reasons why, uh, if you know anything about uh, reactive programming, one of the big reasons why reactive programming is uh, caught on really big with the Android community is uh, it makes it a lot easier to do all these uh, threaded network calls. It's uh, with, uh, with uh, RxJava, it's essentially uh, one method call that allows you to say, oh, we're, we're, let's, re let's do the uh, observable on an IO thread from the thread pool. Don't run on the main thread, but then you can do a subscribe with and basically make the uh, make everything that it comes back with apply to uh, your main thread. So um, if you're doing, uh, if you're, so if you're not comfortable with your Java threads, you'll learn about them in a real hurry uh, when you're doing any form of uh, your, your Android stuff. Um, big thing, uh, testing, do a, and sort of do uh, what well, I just wanted to do here. I did a, uh, a talk last summer for the uh, the 
Android uh, meetup on how to do Dagger, Dagger 2 dependency injection. I just wanted to sh show you the, the, the espresso test. Well, you know, two of the ways for testing. Number one is you can do JUnit. So if you're doing simple, um, so if you have simple sort of POJOs, that type of uh, presenter code, uh, that type of stuff, you can just do it all with uh, JUnit testing. But for testing your, uh, for, for things that involve the actual Android framework itself, you have, uh, you have things like, uh, well, you have Espresso, which is the UI. You also have RoboElectric, which is another way of sort of doing unit testing. But RoboElectric basically replaces the virtual device with a virtual machine concept. Um, this one here, if we do, uh, so if we actually run the test, what it'll actually do is the, um, you'll see this app run. And basically what it does, it simulates a user, so it actually types it in. And that's it or whatever. So with espresso testing, uh, you, you have a variety of matchers. Like we say, uh, we clear the text. We say, well, we want to type in. Uh, we can do it. We can do a match saying we expect if we type test, testing into an edit box, testing will be in the edit box. And uh, you can you can you can you can click buttons. You can do all sorts of stuff with the Robo Electric test. Android Studio actually has an espresso recorder, so you don't actually have to sit there and figure it all out. You can basically just run your app. And uh, Android Studio, the espresso tester, will write the whole test for you. Um, sort of, uh, sort of getting onto um, with the whole fra um, framework concept as far as how you how do you structure an Android application? I mean, I've sort of this basic stuff has sort of been demonstrating the Android plumbing, um, the MVP pattern, the model view presenter pattern is a very uh, is a very popular way of structuring Android applications because the idea with a model view presenter is you don't want a lot of your, your Android plumbing code mixed with your business logic. So you can put all your business logic in a presenter. Uh, you avoid any form of framework calls or anything in your presenter. The idea with, a, um, with an Android application is you want to spend uh, the, spending less time doing uh, the plumbing, the Android plumbing, and more time functioning, working on your, on your actual code. So the other pattern, too, that you'll see, too, is the MMVM pattern, which is the model view view presenter, what is it, pattern, because there's a whole bunch, there's, um, Google's adopted it for some of their architectural components. So, so it's basically just another way of structuring your app. But the idea being with the whole thing of it is you don't want basically God activities. And so, so instead of having one, one massive activity that manages everything, you break it down. So you have a view object that all it does is the display. It knows how to make all the text views everything work. You have a presenter which uh, knows how to, uh, which can, which knows how to fetch the data from the model and feed it into the view. It's another talk onto itself. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, I actually have an app that I can show later. That was sort of hard to, it's sort of here, Will. Yeah, I mean, we, we, I've never been able to make the difference between the Yeah. Uh, Medium.com is, I mean, is full of all, is a great resource for looking all that uh, stuff or whatever on, uh, in fact, a lot of this stuff you'll see. I mean, so, 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 so to put it in, um, sort of, so, so, so basically what happens is you, you start with your, uh, your, your view would be your activity. Uh, there's something I won't really cover, something called a fragment that some people use to represent a, a view. Typically what happens is you, uh, you, you, you create, uh, 
to create interfaces. So you'd have uh, my hello world inner, my hello world view, and then you'd have your activity, your fragment, implement that. Same thing with the, pre and the, the presenter and uh, the model. The presenter is basically the logic. So what happens is, is your activity, uh, when your first activity fires up, the, it, it loads all the, the view objects. The view would tell the presenter, um, do your thing. Um, the presenter, if it's say we're, we have to query data from, I don't know, from, from say a REST interface would, would go and would uh, query the REST interface. Now, what does the REST interface look like? The presenter doesn't know. It would go to the model, it would say to the model, get, get me the data from the REST interface. The, the model knows how to talk to the REST interface, how to structure it and hands it off to the presenter. The presenter, once it knows the, um, the model, We'll basically take the data it's collected, feeds it uh, back to the view. Honestly, trying to talk about MVP is actually a talk unto itself. It's kind of there's kind of a lot to it, but the, and then once once you kind of figure it out, you have sort of have your woohoo, your uh, eureka moment. But um, and then the developer.android.com if you ever get totally confused it's a great way to start but basically what happens is is, is they took uh, some of the so some of the things like so they so basically for instance they have um, like one of the issues that people have is um, with with one to solve one problem they have with the architecture components is trying to do do, do um, SQLite is a whole bunch of, you have to write a whole bunch of code, call a whole bunch of interfaces, set a whole bunch of methods, blah, blah, blah. With the architectural components, your SQLite is a whole bunch of and annotations. You implement the method, you say what the annotation is, you need to do your database query, and the annotation processor does all the plumbing for you. So you spend less time writing boilerplate, worrying about how the plumbing works, and just what you need to happen. Um, most of the popular like that was sort of brings up to my like sort of the architecture components, one libraries, um, retrofit like Square, the company Square. If you know the Square credit card people, um, they're very they're they're well known in Android for a lot of their open source projects. For instance, there's a lot of common tasks. Don't do it. You can find libraries. For instance, one of their popular uh, one of their most popular libraries that's used in a lot of applications was called their retrofit library, which basically takes. Um, which basically will take JSON data, will query a REST interface done with interfaces, and it will convert it all to POJOs. And you just annotate your POJOs, you feed it, um, and again, it's all annotate. The thing with retrofit is you just annotate the um, your interface of what you need to, of how you call the REST interface, and it um, does it all for you. They they it, it does all the uh, the plumbing for you because you don't want it. My first Android app, I actually. Wrote, did a manual JSON processing and Android never like never processed JSON data yourself. There's plenty of libraries out there uh, that will take care of it for you. The other talk I did, uh, another big thing is uh, Dagger 2, which is dependency injection, which is kind of, again, that's another talk onto itself. It's basically you, you can create shared objects, which allow you to reduce the, uh, uh, the memory footprint. Um, there's something called... Uh, Like I have two activities called uh, um, the share, called basically called uh, the greeting activity and the love activity. They have um, a shared preferences. Shared preferences is basically a key value store that allows you for your application just to just to store key value pairs. Um, and the one thing though with uh, with using de uh, Dagger dependency injection is basically the shared preferences object I can use with both activities. So instead of having two instances of shared preferences. In my process, there's there's just one version of it. Um, the other thing too, there's butter knife, which does, uh, which is another way to, uh, which which um, the butter knife library by Jake Wharton, who is uh, if you do any form of Android or Java, you've probably heard his name because he's re he's re he's big now and now into Kotlin. Uh, you'll see a lot of talks out there on Android that involve uh, 
uh, Jake Wharton. He did a library called Butter Knife, which uh, allows you to um, set up if you're getting your your wit your uh, the views and your layout, things like text views, edit text, instead of trying to find them, you basically just annotate and it will handle all the um, finding uh, finding of them for you. Um, go through here. The part, yeah, here, that was, that was, that was uh, my next one. For instance, I have this activity here. I call it love activity. I haven't run it yet. We'll see what happens. You have the ability. It will, uh, you can actually, you can on the fly, they have, it will actually. Uh, sure. I may have totally just broken everything, but there we go. We've just converted the application that you originally saw was Java, which apparently is Oh, Kotlin's not configure. Oh, I'm not going to bother. But anyway, so basically, just like that, we can um, just take in everything and uh, converted it to Kotlin. So obviously, there's a few things. Um, what there has to in order in the, in the Gradle.field file, we have to I have to enable Kotlin, which I'm not going to do at this time. But you can do. Um, one of the interesting things about this is there's a bug right now in Android Studio. If you um, create a new project and convert your uh, main activity right away to Kotlin, it will break. It won't be able to find your activity. You actually have to create a second activity, uh, delete your main activity, and make your second activity your first activity um, to get around it. But hopefully it'll get figured out soon. But you'll notice now that a lot of, uh, one of the interesting things too about uh, sort of get into Kotlin is a, a lot of the Kotlin design is based on uh, effective Java. For instance, one of the things about Kotlin, you know, you, um, here is that all classes in Kotlin are declared final, unless you specify them otherwise. All methods in your uh, class, all methods in, your, in a Kotlin class are declared final, unless you specify them otherwise. For instance, like the onCreate here specifies that we want to override the onCreate method in uh, activity, but that's just sort of one of those little things to go go on. Um, other thing too, just sort of I'm going down my what are we doing? I'll just sort of wrap. Uh, basically, uh, Firebase, uh, we're familiar with the uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service. Let's say you want to, um, you want to, you want to build a bunch, you want applications that can store data on a uh, database, and uh, you want to, um, you want other applications to save the data, and you don't want to build a uh, server. Um, Firebase is one solution. Amazon has another version of it, but basically, it's a, it's a whole bunch of um, they basically do the infrastructure. They give you a bunch of libraries, and you can uh, uh, and you can save things. Firebase has analytics. You can create goals. They so can specify how people use your application to keep track of uh, things like that. Um, the whole thing with Firebase to take away is you don't have to build a whole backend infrastructure if you don't want to. Um, you can uh, they'll do it'll all be taken care of for you. Um, the pitfalls sort of just mentioned the uh, uh, memory leaks. Is um, you got to be careful with what you're with what references you're holding on to. There's a great tool called Leak Canary uh, that will keep track of it. Because the one thing we need to consider is um, when you're doing things like uh, enterprise stuff and you have a machine, say with uh, you know, with, say 64 gigabytes of RAM, potentially you know, leaking a couple hundred K here or there isn't really a big deal in the grand scheme of things. Um, with our phones, they don't have. Uh, a lot of a lot of memory, so we don't do that. Sort of total aside here. One interesting thing: um, um, why do uh, Android devices have more memory than iOS devices? Actually, has to do with the uh, the way they garbage collect. iOS devices do uh, basically do reference counts, and when things get to be zero, they they uh, release it. Whereas our Android devices do mark basically will do mark and sweep. And the reason why they have a lot of memory on uh, Android devices is uh, it's actually to reduce the garbage collection because they, they, these device, like Android phones by design are just designed to leak memory to minimize the garbage collection because the garbage collection, when it will happen, will sort of cause a, a brief pause when it's collecting. So the less, um, so the less um, leaks you have, the less often your app needs to be uh, 
be garbage collected. And you can do a whole bunch of, you know, there's, there's tools as well. There's whole talks on how to figure out um, if you're apps leaking memory or not. There's tools um, for that. It's all part of the performance thing, sort of. As I said, the uh, tutorial stuff is, um, is, you know, keep track of the dates. I think, too, to keep in mind is um, your, Play Store, your Play Store rules. Um, when you start, if you start publishing apps to the Play Store, they have rules. For instance, if you're creating a um, an app that's designed for children, you want to be all you want to be all ages. If you have an app that uses GPS data, uh, GPS data is um, because it's it's because it vi it's considered you know potentially privacy invading. Um, all apps that use GPS data have to be rated uh, for uh, teens and above. Uh, young ch you know they're not they're not rated for young children. Sort of on the subject too. Of, uh, the other thing too to keep in mind with permissions is there's what's called um, danger. There's uh, uh, there's permissions in the Android manifest file. You specify what permissions you want. It used to be with Android. Um, basically, the moment you installed the app, it got all the permissions. But now a lot of the applications they have what they call dangerous permissions. Things like GPS data, um, using the camera, using uh, you know accessing the uh, the phone's contacts. That's why sometimes when you uh, when you use an application and you know you've just installed it and you want to take a picture, it'll say allow allow application to use the camera because it, and you have to if you're designing an app you have to you have to account for the fact that what if the user doesn't grant you permission? Like what if you want the GPS data and they don't want you to have the GPS data? What are you going to do? You know, like you a lot of apps just die right away or or at least handle it gracefully. So yeah. Uh, ideal, ideally, uh, you should be checking for access. You know, like because because you sh you'll check. You should be checking for permissions. You should come back and say, yes, we can do this, or uh, no, we can't. Because I mean, it'll happen at sort of the, lo the lower level, and you should be prepared for if you don't have permission. You know, because like, otherwise, if you just go ahead and assume you have camera permission, and then you, you try to grab the camera, you can end up with like a null pointer. Or that. Yeah. You, you know, you, you could you could just tell the user, you know what, if you're not going to give me, per if we can't use the camera, I can't do anything for you. So we'll just end it here. You know, but you have to you have to account for that fact and be aware of how you handle um, things like uh, you know because they because they because they, um, they take user privacy fairly seriously. I don't know. You can uh, in Android, and that's one of the things you got to be aware of. Of, is the permissions because typically uh, you get things, for instance, too, like one of the issues a couple of years ago to answer one of the questions, people were making a big deal about the fact that flashlight apps, why do flashlight apps need network access? So people assume that the flashlight apps, well, they need internet access, so they must be doing something really, really malicious. The reality was these flashlight apps were using ad networks. These ad networks needed to get their ads. And the only way they could get the ads was they needed internet access. So that was sort of so people were saying, oh, what? so people were freaking out. Why does your app need internet access? Well, because they were running an ad network. I mean, sort to get on that subject. I mean, the, this um, when it's speaking of the Play Store, for instance, you can't implement your own ad network and run your apps on it. Google will pull your app. You know, all your apps have to go through the uh, the Google ad networks. Uh, they, as a rule, at a dollar you put through Google Play. I think it's about what is it around 30, 40 cents they take. Um, so if you have a so if you have a dollar app, I think you'll lose about what is it about thirty cents on the dollar for every uh, thing that you generate. All those um, all those games, you know, the the pay, the play, pay as you go things, they're taking out thirty cents. Um, if you if you have this idea of oh I'm going to make an app and I'm going to run ads on it and I'm going to get rich, you know, unless you have an installed base and the hundreds of thousands of users that are using your app at um, you know. All the time, like you, you see people going, "Oh, I have like ten thousand users. I make five cents a day," you know. So, it's it's not always the most profitable way of doing things. Um, all I can really say with Android at this point, because we think we're going to wrap up soon, anyways. I was just kind of ranting on here. Is get Android Studio, install it. It's free to download all the Android software. You don't need an Android phone to do it. So, as I said, you can do it with the Android device it with an Android virtual device. Although, if you have your own Android phone. It's kind of cool, actually, to be holding a phone that's running your software. 
So um, as far as that goes, there's plenty of tutorials out there, Udacity, whatever. I mean, the uh, learning curve in Android in the beginning is a little steep, but once you get over it, it's, uh, you know, everything sort of starts to click and start to uh, make sense. And if you're kind of, you know, sort of doing Java stuff and kind of going, eh, what, what can I do next? This is another way to sort of just sort of take your whole knowledge. Like in the beginning, you think like, when I first started, I was used to thinking in terms of servers and large architectures, thinking, well, how complicated can a phone get? You know, it's, this isn't like 100 instances. It's just a phone, but it's actually just as hard. You know, thinking big is hard, but thinking small is just as hard as well. So it's, it makes for a great challenge, if for nothing else. So on that note, I'm just going to say, just go for it. You have nothing to lose. Just best of luck with everything. And uh, thanks for uh, listening to me talk for the last hour. Thank <laughs> you.